Clemens, and I have a question. Why is President Biden threatening to rethink relations with Saudi Arabia? Let's get to the bottom line. OPEC set off a firestorm in Washington when it decided to slash global oil production by 2 million barrels a day earlier this month. The White House took it as an act of aggression by Saudi Arabia. President Joe Biden said there would be, quote, consequences for what they've done with Russia. And the National Security Council said it's reviewing the entire future of relations between Saudi and the U.S. Democrats in Congress reacted with even more fury, with some leading senators demanding that the U.S. immediately freeze all aspects of cooperation with Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia denied collaborating with Russia to raise the price of oil right before Americans head to the polls in their midterm elections. And Saudi officials have been fighting back, saying that politics had nothing to do with the decision. So is Washington overreacting? Is Riyadh overreaching? Or is Saudi Arabia, like many other countries around the world, recalibrating who its friends and allies in the world are, slowly drifting away from the U.S. and warming up to Russia and China? Today we're talking with Ali Shihabi, a Saudi commentator and former head of the Arabia Foundation in Washington, D.C. He's the author of The Saudi Kingdom, Between the Jihadi Hammer and the Iranian Anvil. And Danielle Pletka, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where she focuses on U.S. foreign policy towards the Middle East. Thank you both for joining me. Ali, let me just start out with you. Right now, I, I mean, it's rare that we've seen a foreign policy tizzy of the sort that we've seen after the decision by OPEC to cut uh, two million barrels of, uh, barrels of oil a day, and a lot of anger at the Saudis because there was this notion that there had been a deal after President Biden's trip. Tell us, from your perspective, what just went down. Well, it's a horrible misunderstanding, really, because, yes, there was a deal. Uh, there was an understanding that Saudi Arabia would do its best to stop oil going to $200. Uh, and, in effect, they did that by incrementally increasing production over the summer. So the Saudi understanding was that our job is to make sure, and it's also in Saudi interest, to make sure that the price of oil does not get into the ridic a, a ridiculous level that has multiple negative impacts on everybody concerned, producers and consumers. But that did not mean that Saudi Arabia cannot protect the price of its primary commodity, which it lives on, uh, and allow it to fall. And I think that's where the misunderstanding came in, because when uh, you know, Aramco and the Saudi oil authorities and OPEC started to see demand destruction and a recession coming up uh, and the need to reduce production to keep the price where it was, really. Uh, that is what they did. And markets have proven them to be right. I mean, the price did not shoot up. In fact, it's dropped a little bit, but it stayed around the $90. But, so, but, you know, but, if you're a believer in markets... And I think America taught us all to believe in markets. Yeah. Uh, markets spoke, really, and, and uh, confirmed the wisdom of the Saudi decision. Well, I want to jump to, to, to Danny a minute, but, but on, on the issue of the price of oil, you have other factors in place. You have, you know, that Game of Thrones line, winter is coming, uh, is out there. You also have uh, a Russian weaponization of energy, cutting off supplies. Uh, of gas and, and fuel and, uh, to, to many European nations. So you have other factors that have driven that price of fuel and energy up. You have protests around the country. So at what point do the Saudis think a, a price is sustainable for them versus, say, Eastern Europe? No, look, the Saudi and OPEC approach is to try and keep the price in the 90 to $100 range. That serves everybody's interests, including the U.S. shale oil industry. Hmm which needs that price to invest. Now, if things, again, this is a dynamic process, so nothing is carved in steel. If in the next couple of months, uh, you know, the market turns, demand increases, China stops its long, uh, its COVID policies, then OPEC will react. And, and Saudi Arabia has said that. It is not going to allow prices to shoot up. But at the same time, it's not going to allow prices to collapse. And uh, I mean, the kingdom lives on the price of oil. It's so much more important for it than it is for anybody else, let alone America, which is a, you know, a net exporter itself. So that's where people are so surprised by the reaction in Riyadh. Danielle Pletka, um, I basically was taught essentially 
that Saudi Arabia was America's ally in the closet. We didn't talk about it a lot. It was sort of there. We kind of turned a blind eye to human rights issues now and then because at the end of the day, to backstop American foreign policy around the world, Saudi Arabia would help with Pakistan, would help here, help there. And so there was a structural bit of the relationship that was deep uh, beneath what we could see above. And I'm just wondering whether, as you look at what's begun to unfold, is that coming undone? Um, and is it good that it's coming undone? Well, I think that the idea behind what you're talking about is coming undone. This uh, this notion that there is a compact between the United States and Saudi Arabia. We underwrite your security. You underwrite our energy security. And then, you know, we just all pretend to be best friends and, and look away when, when you misbehave on, on the human rights front or on the religious front or on the support for terrorism front, which was a very long and problematic period. But the realities of the relationship haven't changed at all. You know, it, it's merely the mythology that surrounds the relationship that has changed. The realities are we buy energy, Saudi Arabia sells energy, and that's not going to change for a long time. The other factor here is, you know, we look at the neighborhood, right? Who are we choosing among exactly here? You know, is it that we prefer the Iranians? Uh, the Saudis have have been the most important country in the Gulf region for a very long time. They've been important to us. Iran is not going to supplant them, notwithstanding the hopes of people from the Obama administration or retreads of the Obama administration and the Biden administration. And so you know, we can talk about how they let us down or they lied to us. We can talk about how we wish that they behaved better and didn't murder dissidents in their consulates. But that's not going to alter the fundamental realities of the relationship. You, you just mentioned Iran, Danny, and, and one of the things that I was able to break, a very minor story that became big on Twitter, um, was that the United States was canceling a USGCC uh, meeting. It was an integrated a working group on integrated air and missile defense, you know, focused on Iran. It was scheduled for October 17th. And U.S. officials were not going to show up to that. I found the word that it had been canceled. The White House later said, oh, it's not been canceled. We're just eventually going to po postpone it. But part of this is the dynamic of how Iran is seeing this tension in the GCC and tension particularly between Saudi Arabia and the United States. From your perspective, is this, you know, frustration that Joe Biden is now expressing and a lot of particularly Democratic uh, senators and members of Congress, is Iran just enjoying the show? Well, you know, again, we have the problem in Washington, D.C., of pretending to ourselves that everything is a bilateral conversation. You know, Saudi Arabia, you've disappointed us for the last time, and therefore we're not going to come to this, this important defense conference. Um, Iran, you're busy murdering men, women, and children wantonly in the streets. Hmm. And, 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 but, but we're not talking to you. We're just talking to Saudi Arabia. We're just mad about the oil and gas. We still are mad at you, Iran, about your illegal nuclear program and, and your terrorism and, and your failure to come to come back to the JCPOA with us. This is this is foreign policy as if it's high school, unfortunately. And mm. and foreign policy isn't high school. It would be wonderful if we were surrounded by only the best people who did only the nicest things. That is not the reality of the world. And the Biden administration's willingness to sort of um, to to try to constantly course correct based on who was nice to me yesterday is an extraordinarily dangerous thing to do. Because as you say, Steve, correctly, the Iranians read this, but it's not just the Iranians. The Russians read this as well. The Israelis mm. read this. And all of them make decisions based on how they believe the most important country in the world, the most important leader in the world is going to act on any given day. Ali, let's listen to President Biden for a moment. We have a short clip. It is a disappointment, and it says that there are problems. So we've had a presidential statement, Ali Shihabi, that there are problems. It's not like saying this is, you know, that this has to be dealt with. And we've had uh, folks around Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. We, you know, all refer to him as MBS. Um, and you know these folks. Uh, they, too, have said, hey, if America is saying there are problems, there can be problems. How, you know, how have we gone from the fist bump uh, from MBS and Joe Biden meeting in Saudi Arabia recently 
um, to where we're at now. And, and, and what are your observations of the equities that are in danger? Well, look, I think there was a mistake in the uh, thinking behind the visit of President Biden uh, to Jeddah. Uh, it was an important visit. It was good it happened. But I think he took so much political flack from his left that he felt that he had to come to Jeddah and make statements. Hmm. So, you know, from the fist bump to his press conference right after the meeting, he threw a bit of cold water on what could have been a, a, a complete reset, really. Now, that did create a bit of bad blood, but still not enough to make Saudi Arabia consciously want to uh, play in domestic American politics, which is what the Democrats think is happening now. I mean, the Democrats think that this decision had something to do with the upcoming elections. And as you know, the Saudi government came up and said that, uh, you know, there was a request to delay um, uh, the OPEC meeting till after the election. Now, you know, Saudi Arabia doesn't want to get involved in American domestic politics. And frankly, the Republicans have also been warmer to Saudi Arabia than the Democrats over the years. So why on earth would Saudi Arabia, you know, do get get into a, a trap like that? Uh, but still, so they didn't, uh, you know, delay an important meeting uh, to accommodate U.S. domestic political requirements. Now, the Biden administration got very upset about that, but I think it was unwise of them to expect that. Um, and, and that has created, you know, unfortunate bad blood. And what that does, Steve, is it just confirms to Saudi leaders the wisdom of the policy that they've been pursuing in the last few years to diversify their strategic partnership. Because you have to remember, in 2020, Saudi Arabia got into an oil war with Russia and uh, increased production, and the price of oil was brought down to below zero. And American pol politicians, from Congress to governors to the president, went ballistic, and they threatened to withdraw the so-called you know, protection and arms deliveries, and uh, they encouraged Saudi Arabia to go back and cooperate with the Russians, and in effect, that's what happened, and right. the price of oil was brought back up. So on one side, you have the American administration asking you to cooperate with Russia. On the other side, you, they're asking you to break off with Russia because of its invasion of Ukraine. Now, you know, this is a strategic relationship for Saudi Arabia. It's not in this because they like Russia or dislike Russia. It's in it because Russia is the second largest producer of oil on Earth. And to manage the market, they need to coordinate with the Russians. It's as simple as that. And whether Mr. Putin is in power or not, that will continue. When we now know, or we're told anyway, that the U.S. government asked Saudi Arabia to, to, to delay this decision by a month, and that was not done, do, I mean, that to me I get, gets you back into what, what uh, Danny just said, is maybe we need to take the fig leaf off this relationship and just real, realize it's going to be far more transactional than it had been uh, in the past. Maybe it was transactional in the past, but there was a predictability in that that maybe well, we don't have anymore. Know, there's a history to this also. There's over a decade now of American politicians saying we are exiting the region, hmm. we're losing interest in the region, we are uh, pivoting to Asia. Uh, so, you know, if, if your best friend keeps on telling you that, you know, he doesn't want to be your best friend anymore, it's going to impact the way you look at him. Hmm. So, yes, Saudi Arabia has been building relations with China with Russia, but also with the UK and with France and with Brazil and with South Africa. The South African president is in the kingdom at the moment, and they're talking military um, procurement from South Africa. So they're opening up strategic relationships with multi-parties hmm. because a monogamous relationship with America, given the American political system, uh, is not something that any country can rely on, really. Danny, what would you be advising the Joe Biden team to do right now that it's not doing? <laughs> That's very generous of you, and thank you for the compliment. Um, uh, look, you know, the Joe Biden team isn't necessarily going to take advice 
um, from me, but I think there are plenty of people who are saying the same thing. You, you know, you cannot you cannot try to play these games in the Middle East. I think the one point where I truly agree with, with Ali, and I agree with a lot of what he said, but where I truly agree with Ali is this, the, this notion that the United States can, for a decade plus, talk about the pivot to Asia. I always say to people, you know what pivoting does, right? You know, you are facing something and you turn away and you give your back to somebody. Follow that with, you know, a, a, a precipitous and disastrous withdrawal from Iraq in 2011, and then our, our humiliating uh, and disgraceful withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, under the Biden administration. And any country that has relied on us has to ask those questions. What I would tell the Biden administration is, you know, look, you don't need to worry as much about Saudi Arabia. When push comes to shove, the notion that the British or the French, or, excuse me for, you know, I'm not laughing out loud here, the Chinese or the Russians are going to come to your aid in extremists is, is, is completely laughable. Uh, the notion that they could buy weaponry from them, that, that's fine. You can diversify your military supply. And I know that our defense contractors will be very depressed by that. But the idea that somehow the U.S. can be supplanted by one of these our other powers is incorrect. Only we can supplant ourselves. We need to decide and uh, that we want to maintain this relationship that we do not want to ignore when Saudi Arabia does things that we disapprove of, uh, but that we have an important relationship with them that is in some ways transactional, in some ways historical, but nonetheless an important relationship, and not pretend to ourselves that somehow a pivot is going to happen that's going to enable us to run away from, whether it's Mohammed bin Salman mm -hmm. or it's Ayatollah Khamenei, mm -hmm. or it's Israel. That's just not going to happen. Um, thank you for that. Ali, um, can I, you know, please can go I ahead. Just make a point there? Yes. I mean, you know, it's not apples with apples, absolutely. Uh, nobody can supplant America. Uh, but nobody assumes that America will come to the aid the way it did in 1990 under any circumstance. So countries have to come up with a bag of other tools. China has influence with Iran, Russia has influence with Iran. The Europeans, the, the French and the Europeans have a capacity to project a certain amount of power. So nobody can duplicate what America can do. But you have to improvise. And that is what Saudi Arabia is going to do. It's going to improvise because nobody expects uh, America to have the political appetite to transport 400,000 troops to Saudi Arabia if that was ever required again. That's not going to happen, except in a miracle. So you have to work to improvise and find another way around that. And that is the way that you're going to diversify your strategic relationships. It, it, despite the economic rationale, isn't the act still a gift to Republicans and a slap on the wrist or at least a wake-up call for Democrats? Well, Democrats should listen to the president of Ukraine. He came out on Twitter and thanked Saudi Arabia for its support. Now, that involved uh, its involvement in the prisoner exchange, financial aid, but also voting in the U.N., so if the president of Ukraine does not think that Saudi Arabia sided with Mr. Putin, with all due respect to Republican, uh, to Democratic politicians, who are they to accuse Saudi Arabia of siding with Mr. Putin? Saudi Arabia was looking after its own interests. It has no choice but to uh, cooperate with, with the Russians. Now, look, it's a collateral issue. Saudi Arabia has, has enough of an institutional memory, which many in D.C. don't have in the political sphere, to remember that you cannot play politics in America. It is certainly not, has, has not done this to damage the Democrats or to help the Republicans. It wants to stay out of this. Now, it's the administration maybe that saw a political value in it, but the price of oil really hasn't moved. So, I mean, if the price of oil had shot up to $150, we could be talking about that. But the price of oil has actually dropped a couple of dollars since that uh, decision. We can put so, the graphic yeah. up, actually, that shows, in yeah. fact, what the, the spike up and then, you know, how it's become come to down where the market is uh, bringing us. So thank you for raising that. Go ahead, Ali. So I don't know, really, and I don't know where you get this $76 uh, figure about, because the price has been around $90 uh, before the OPEC meeting and went up a couple of dollars and then came down. So, again, markets speak, mm. you know. 
uh, and, and markets determine what's happening. And, uh, and this is why I think, you know, it's really baffling people in Riyadh how, they, how the Democrats are taking this personally. And I think right. the problem was that, that, they, that Mr. Biden and the Democrats thought that the visit to Riyadh, warts and all, uh, despite what, you know, the fist bump and the press conference, bestowed such a favor on Saudi Arabia that Saudi Arabia was going to do whatever they wanted even if it's not in their interest. Right. And Saudi Arabia can't afford to do that, really. Right. Danny, um, I, I just want to ask you kind of, an, a, a, as, as we wrap this conversation up, a forward-looking question. If you want to measure the, the basically contraction of American power in the world, don't just look at your foes, look at your allies. That the allies' behavior changes in the region as much as your, their, their foes do. And I'm just interested in, in, in basically, as you look forward, is there any prospect that this autumn, you know, gets better, or are we looking essentially at the disintegration of America's assets and relationships in the world in an ongoing kind of mess like we're seeing right now, or do you see any hope on the horizon that we might be able to begin to get some of these these things right from an American perspective? You're asking a great question, I think, and and one that's very hard to answer. Look, the way. First of all, I, I want to say something just to address a little bit about what your previous question to Ali. Uh, the worst disservice, the, in the litany of disservices that were done to, to our international relations by the Trump administration, one of the worst disservices was the injection of partisanship into it. The notion that somehow the Democrats belong to Iran and Saudi Arabia and Israel belong to the Republicans. This is unsustainable uh, and and completely antithetical to America's interests not the GOP or the Democrats mm. and you know the sooner we can offload that stupidity uh, the, the better it will be as to you know your question look one of the things that is depressing but true about the reality of the Middle East is that it is not the United States or our good friends and allies who decide what the course, of future course of our actions is going to be. It is our adversaries, right? It is the Irans. It is the Al-Qaeda's. It is the ISIS's. Mm. It is the Assad's. It is the Hamas's and the Hezbollah's. They are the ones that decide where we are going to be. And if we forget who we need to work with, what our interests are, and how to best support our principles and values and our alliances and partnerships, we give the advantage to them. They will decide where we go in the future. That's really not what we want, but it is the appropriate long-term view. Well, Ali Shihabi, Saudi commentator and author, and Daniel Pletka, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, I really appreciate you both being with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. So what's the bottom line? We're living in a time when the world's tectonic plates are shifting. And just like those plates under our feet, the ones that move and cause earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes, above ground global power is moving and shifting right before our eyes. The same forces that kind of, sort of kept the world together in the last century are just slipping away. U.S. power in the world is receding on a relative basis, and both America's adversaries and its allies feel the change. I'm not saying that America is weak. I'm just saying that it's just not all powerful. Saudi Arabia pushed to cut oil production for several reasons. Here's to name a few. One, the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, MBS, and Joe Biden don't particularly like each other. Number two, Trump showered Saudi Arabia with attention, for better or worse, and Team Biden barely gives it any attention. Number three, the global economic slowdown is a real thing, and OPEC does have a solid argument regarding making cuts. And number four, and this one hits home the most, there's an election happening in America in a couple of weeks, and Saudi Arabia wants to show that it can make an impact here if it wants.